And uh, the next major case I'd like to mention is the Nebraska case. One of the grimmest and most disturbing examples of heinous crimes, institutional corruption and abuse of political power is said to have occurred back in the 1980s in the heartland of America. And it is known as the Franklin Conspiracy or the Franklin Cover-Up. The conspiracy involved a child pedophilia ring allegedly involving prominent politicians and business leaders in the Omaha, Nebraska area with ties leading all the way to some of the most powerful circles in Washington, D.C. Franklin Federal Credit Union scandal, centered in Omaha, opens a window into the hideous world of child abuse and of organized illegal drug peddling, patronized and protected by powerful figures in politics and business. A major investigation uh, headed up by John DeCamp, former state senator, a good friend of mine. John is an attorney here in Lincoln. He is also a lobbyist. He's a former state legislator. He's a Vietnam veteran. And uh, we're here to interview John about his new book, titled The Franklin Cover-Up, subtitled Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska. John, how did you get involved in this mess? Quite accidentally. I had been a senator uh, for about 16 years and come across a man named Larry King, who was the individual who opened those two national conventions, sang the national anthem, uh, was told he was the fastest rising star, particularly fastest rising black star in the Republican Party, and uh, attended some of his largest parties ever put on by him, and from my recollection, probably two of the largest, most expensive parties ever put on by anybody in this country. And uh, so when the Franklin Credit Union failed, I had more than a passing interest in uh, observing and, and following up and, and seeing what it was all about. The credit union was closed uh, for the information of our viewers on November 4th of 1988. The FBI and uh, IRS mm -hmm. came in and closed it down. Right. National media interest in the case flickered in 1988 when the Franklin Community Federal Credit Union was raided by federal agencies and shut down. Franklin's manager was Lawrence E. Larry King Jr., then 44 a rising star in state and national Republican circles, an officer of the National Black Republican Council. King sang the national anthem at the GOP national conventions in 1984 and 1988. Franklin Federal Credit Union was a small people's bank in Omaha, Nebraska. Larry King was general manager. Thank you. This is especially an exciting day for me. Larry King ran the Franklin Credit Union and a few other businesses in Franklin, Nebraska. A man who chartered private jets hosted extravagant parties, and maintained bodyguards was simply in charge of a credit union in a little town of Nebraska, which happened to be located near Boys Town, a Catholic institution for orphaned youth. This was supposed to be a $2 million credit union that was just a, a minority credit union designed to help the black people in the, in the Omaha area. In fact, uh, as they quickly discovered, and we don't even know this is the truth or not the truth at this point, it could be far, far more, but they discovered 40 million uh, missing. Well, when you only have two to start, and you have records that show you stole 40, uh, create some baffling questions. Nearly $40 million was missing from the coffers of the small, ostensibly community-oriented credit union. The financial scandal turned into something more when it became known that children from Omaha and its surroundings said they had been flown from city to city to be abused at parties held by Franklin's officers and well-known Nebraskans, including nationally prominent Republican Party activists. And what we developed there was that children were being taken out of orphanages and foster homes driven to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away, and flown to Washington, D.C. for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators. From 1979, Larry King developed close commercial ties to Boys Town, and Boys Town youngsters were sent to work for his companies. Boys Town, Nebraska is America's favorite children's charity. Located in the heartland of America, Boys Town youth have come from many backgrounds and locales. King used Boys Town as a source of young boys for his business and for sex and drug orgies. We didn't go to Nebraska with a conspiracy theory in our mind, hoping to prove it. We went to Nebraska to try and work out what happened, and we found a, a conspiracy of silence. King's lavish lifestyle burst into flames in 1988, just before the Republican National Convention, when seven victims of King's child abuse and prostitution stepped forward. The victims claimed that King took them to various parties that he threw for the Republican elite. And at these parties, the children were abused. Did you know that Larry King was taking boys out of boys' town? No. Yeah, I don't think there was really nobody else that didn't. That didn't know that? They didn't know that. Oh, they know they've had complaints every time, every week on rape and molestation. They know that. Larry King was, I would say, the center of transporting the children around the country. The, the airplanes were usually um, in his name, at least in his name. They were paid for by Larry King. Larry King was a facilitator. That was the man that was in charge. I mean, we flew with him on the trips, had flown to Chicago, was in a hotel room. I was dressed in a negligee. There were, I believe, prominent men, a lot of young boys at this hotel performing certain things sexually with other men. The kids he liked were mainly around the age of uh, 
probably about 8 and 13. It was mainly uh, fondly an oral sex with him. He did have some anal sex, but he usually did that with the older kids. Didn't care, you know, wanted sex, nasty, you know, I don't even know if you can call it sex, you know, and uh, take it any way he can get it, pay for it if he liked to, but if he had to take it by force, he would. But children were not merely abused. One victim described an incident at a farm near Elkhorn, Nebraska in 1981 or 82 where a 10-year-old boy was repeatedly sodomized and beaten by older men. One of the men took up a pitchfork, playfully playing with him at first, but finally sticking one tine into him. While the boy screamed and the other men stood around and laughed, finally the whole pitchfork was stuck through him, killing him. Snuff films were involved as well. Another young boy was taken by someone in the King Circle from Nebraska to another city and forced to perform oral sex on a man. As the abuser reached orgasm, he shot the boy in the head with a pistol, all of which was filmed. Larry King was more violent uh, more sure of himself, you know, I mean, I would, you know, see him fuck a 10-year-old boy in the ass, you know, and, until he bled and, you know, just go out and stop and, you know, push him down, you know, and, you know, and then go out and, you know, meet with decent people. What made the Franklin cover-up case so compelling and downright shocking is that big names were said to be involved. This included not just figures connected with the Franklin Credit Union, but also prominent individuals like a Nebraska court judge, the chief of police in Omaha, and many, many more. In fact, the allegation of involvement also extended to former President George Bush Sr., Dick Cheney, Barney Frank, and many others. All the kids that I've talked to discussed that they were flown around uh, on small plans, and I have hundreds of receipts. This one is going to Washington, D.C. He would fly us to uh, nice places or people's houses. There would be gentlemen there. They would like things done to them sexually or they would like to do things to me sexually. Some of the parties when they started off were straight political type parties with no sex. So you were in the White House? Yes. How did you gain access? Well, I came down with uh, Larry King. What time of night? It was usually around uh, midnight and it was kind of a, a gift for our services that we were doing. And then when some of the men had left, some of the politicians had left, the ones that had planned on engaging in some type of sexual activity, that would come after the party. Paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. The White House press secretary, Marlon Fitzwater, said he knew nothing of this investigation. Homosexual prostitution probe and snares officials of Bush Reagan White House call boys given midnight tour of the White House. On the backside, it talks about children being taken off the streets of America. Uh, in addition to credit card fraud, the investigation is said to be focused on the illegal interstate prostitution, abduction, and use of minors for sexual perversion, extortions, larceny, and related illicit drug trafficking. The uh, pedophile ring homosexual pedophile ring. Uh, they were transporting these kids from Omaha to Des Moines, to Minneapolis, to Milwaukee, to Madison, and back to Omaha. One of King's victims who spoke out two years before there even was a Franklin scandal was Paul Bonacci. He told an incredible tale of an underground network of adults who kidnap and sell children for sex. But Paul Bonacci, when he was uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, was recruited by these people to be one of them and to act as a, a, a buffer and in shopping centers, parks, public places to attract the children at his age over near the car. The adults in the, involved in the ring would grab them and uh, they would kidnap them. Bonassi claims that an organized ring of pedophiles abducts children and forces them into a life of child pornography and prostitution, and that it happened to him. And they force you to do things, and, and they, they photograph it, they, they film it. The whole purpose for that is to either blackmail you into staying with them or split your mind up so that you don't even remember who you are. Paul relayed that at the age of eight, he began attending King's parties as a child prostitute. Paul claimed that Democratic Senator Barney Frank had abused him, and he was given midnight tours of the White House, only to be taken to a separate location shortly thereafter and abused. In talking to Paul Benassi, he told me about the number of times when he and others were taken out of schools, private schools in Omaha, uh, driven by limousine to Sioux City, Iowa, and placed on private jets and flown to Washington, D.C. for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators. Paul told me, and has drawn for me, the living quarters of the White House. He was also involved in kidnapping. Oh, yeah. What knowledge do you have of that? They'd have what they call catalog kids. Mm -hmm. They would basically just go out driving around looking for kids. Uh -huh. And 
they would take pictures of them and go to these wealthy, influential people and say, you know, would you be interested in this one or that one or the next one? Mm -hmm. And they would basically go snatch them. They have a crew that goes in certain parts of town and they, they ask for the ages. We want them between six and ten. And they'll say, we want them all white. And that's what they'll get. We want three. And we want them in those age brackets. They sent out scouts, just like a scout, but the guy was a perv to decide who he was going to kidnap. And they would take pictures and without their knowledge. A guy named Rusty Nelson was taking pictures of them while they were doing this sort of thing. And uh, so he had these pictures uh, of these dignitaries who were involved in these nefarious sexual activities. Rusty Nelson, the photographer for Larry King, attended these parties, documenting powerful men in compromising positions with minors as a form of blackmail for King. In a court hearing in 1999, Rusty Nelson revealed his close relationship with King. Nelson relayed that he had witnessed King phone President Reagan when other individuals couldn't resolve a specific problem. In other words, a man with abuse and child prostitution allegations had a direct line to the then president. In this springtime of hope, some lights seem eternal. America's is. Thank you. God bless you and God bless you. Rusty, uh, no, number one, I, I want people to understand a little bit about you, who you are, how your involvement started with this with this whole sordid story that, that we're all into. Well, I've been a professional photographer for almost 25 years now. Um, when I was first starting out and getting established, going to this bar and taking pictures, they were doing drag shows. It was a, a gay bar. And I started taking pictures of the drag queens and selling them to the performers. So I mentioned to the owner of the bar that I was looking for some work. I was hinting to him that, you know, I could use the job there. Lo and behold, he hooked me up with Larry King. And I had no idea who Larry King was. And um, a lot of it was um, me handcuffed with my hands behind my head um, and my feet tied. And most of the time, Larry King took pictures quite a bit during that time. You know, at first it was, everything was all hunky-dory. I, I didn't see anything wrong with anything at all. Everything, I mean, from just, you know, touching to, uh, you know, fruit, squash, you know, huge squash, you know, that big around, you know, stuck into you, in your ass, you know. Uh, and he had me sit in his office at the, at the credit union in ever meetings. and Heat, heat things, hot things, you know poked at you and stuck in you, you know. What, what, uh, what were you doing and what was going on during this initial phase when you just first started to work with Larry King? Well, we were going around, he was doing fundraisers and things like that, you know, $5,000 a plate, you know, uh, suppers and things like that. And I was there to take pictures of these parties. Okay. Okay. Well, lo and behold, afterwards, he was having another party with a few select people, and this was a sex party. I don't know. And maybe next week I know it. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. And you know, Alicia, you're a victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the young age, let's go up camera for a minute. Basically, Larry King was a pimp, and the credit union was just a front. I got those scars on my arm one night at a party where Larry King was, and, and you push your arms together. Denny has King has these same scars, and you push them tight together, and you light cigarettes, and as soon as you get burning, you just drop them down between your arms, and you know let it let it burn. You know, and they made us stand there naked and touch each other while holding our arms together and burn cigarettes. Where, you know, it's on film someplace. It was one of those things where. By the time I figured out what was going on, I was in to it to the point to where I knew I had to protect myself somehow. Yeah. And that's where I went in and I would take pictures from the hip. That's where I'd keep my camera down by my hip oh, okay. and I'd disconnect the flash cord. Mm -hmm. And I'd usually drop in, I'd, I'd keep a spare roll of high speed film and I'd drop that in. And go ahead and start shooting that way and get pictures of some of the people and who they were with. Yeah. 
understand a little bit of what they were doing. You know, for, for instance, what I've been told, there are 23 children that have been to the White House mm -hmm. very quietly. You know, the after hours tours, yes, they do have them. And the kids that would go there would never be seen again. You know, and they may go a few times for that, but it's all hush hush. You know, yeah. When they were done with them, it was done. And they never saw, you never saw them again? No. Nope. The kids would get, they'd get them suited up and boys on boys, old men with boys. Occasionally, they'd have girls. It was a lot of times the younger ones. It was basically white slave trade, you know, where the people would come over and bid on on people. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some of them that I had heard went to Saudi Arabia and some of the Arabic countries over there. Paul Benassi has attended six auctions where the auction children, anyway, any age from three and four all the way up to twenty-one, they put a tag around their neck. They're in their underwear. They have a number on the tag and people down below bid on them. The kids sell for between fifteen to fifty thousand dollars. I've even heard of one kid going for a hundred thousand. Well, who's buying them? One of the things that really made me worry about how to get out was the fact that I'd seen Robert Wadman. He was the, the chief of the Omaha Police Department. Yes, because I'd watched uh, Robert Wadman, the chief of police in Omaha at that time, mm -hmm. um, take a stack of hundred dollar bills, probably an inch and a half, two inches thick, or possibly even thicker, mm -hmm. which I figured would be about $50,000. And this, from what I understood, was a weekly payment that he received from Larry King. A week? For what? For basically keeping things hushed up in Omaha. Wadman was pretty deeply involved in abuse of the kids, was he not? Yeah. Yeah. One of the girls that he frequented was Alicia Owens. Okay, I do remember that Alicia Owens' allegation was that Chief Wadman had made her pregnant. Let me ask you this, you were talking about him paying Wadman, Chief Wadman of the Omaha Police Department, who, by the way, is gone, long gone from there, uh, as yeah, I understand it. Yeah, he's out teaching law in Utah. There was one instance where Colonel Michael Aquino came to a motel room, and he got from Larry King a suitcase, and it was filled with bearer bonds and cash. There was millions of dollars in that thing. It was for the Iran Contra. What about what about Warren Buffett? <sighs> um, Warren was in more than he would like to be known. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I know DeCamp. Uh, his name shows up in DeCamp's book. Yeah, and of course everybody knows who Warren Buffett is. Yep. But he was involved in this level of this kind of stuff that was going on. Oh yeah, yeah. I say uh, I. This is where I got approached on various occasions to do these things, and I wanted no part of it. Mm -hmm. And one person of which was the late Hunter Thompson. Really? You ever hike up into the mountains? Oh yeah, I do that for, I, 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 I like to kill. <laughs> and when you say kill, you're talking about what, neighbors? What, uh... <laughs> we don't want to talk about shooting people, do we? No, but you're, you're teasing thing? when you say you like to kill, right? So Hunter Thompson approached you about doing a snuff film? Yep. Okay. He, he was introduced to me by Larry King, and he offered me $100,000 to shoot a snuff film. Or actually, Larry offered it to me, but mm -hmm. it was through him. Yeah. Larry really pressured me to do it, and I wouldn't do it. If something goes down, nobody will ever believe you if anything's ever said to them about what's going on. Meaning the people that were there and their yeah. position in government and society. There was, there was one night where there was a presidential limousine oh. and the Secret Service had swept the place beforehand yeah. and they kept it secured for a couple days. And, you know, that's what went on. Well, do you think the things that uh, were involved in the Franklin scandal were um, to compromise people st st and to, so that they would have political advantage over them? Oh, yes. Yeah, there was blackmail and, and all that done. It was a they basically had a honeypot scheme set up, you know, where um, they would get political people or people in power or that have money or whatever to um, engage with sex with um, men or, or underage kids or whatever. And then either they would be video videotaping it secretly or, or somehow recording it. There was a house in Washington, D.C where a lot of the children were flown to and um, there would be like pedophilic parties, pedophilic orgies. And this house was wired for audiovisual blackmail by a CIA asset named Craig Spence. This individual here is Craig Spence, who was a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. 
but who purportedly had connections to the CIA and was tied up in this homosexual prostitution inquiry that famously made the cover of the Washington Times in 1989. Spence's Washington, D.C. home had been wired for video and audio surveillance, according to him, by people connected with the CIA. Spence was a Republican lobbyist and was also part of the Franklin Community Federal Credit Union. Later on, he openly expressed his fear he would be killed by the CIA and his death made to look like a suicide. True enough, Spence was found dead inside his hotel room and the coroner declared his death a suicide. I had been in the business for a year or so when I answered the casket hotline. The caller said his name was Craig Spence and I found him to be quite garrulous. Typically, the initial phone call placed to me by clients was brief and they often provided a pseudonym, but Spence disclosed that he was a lobbyist who lived in DC's upscale Calorama neighborhood. He requested a young, boyish escort, 18 or 19 years old. I phoned to Jimmy and he sent an escort to Spence's home. Two hours later, Spence phoned again requesting a second escort, which Jimmy quickly dispatched to his residence. At the time, I found my conversations with Spence extremely perplexing, and I will forever ruefully regret the day that he contacted me. Spence started phoning me almost every day, and he spent up to $20,000 a month on escorts, becoming my most prolific and lucrative client. The vast sums he spent on escorts translated into well over 100 sessions a month. I was puzzled by his exorbitant expenditures, so I questioned the various escorts who had been dispatched to his residence about their respective encounters with Spence. Some described Bacchanalian orgies. Other escorts who had one-on-one -on -one encounters with Spence described his penchant for extreme depravity. He was fond of being shackled, fettered, and whipped, and he also had a predilection for being beaten up and urinated on. Spence was certainly an enigma to me, because I sincerely wondered how he became so deranged. The revelations unfurled by the escorts who called on him prompted me to send only extremely seasoned escorts to his house. I had been interacting with Spence over the phone for a couple of months when he invited me to his Calorama home. Given the anecdotes that were conveyed to me by the escorts who had dealt with Spence face to face, I felt apprehensive when I drove to his home. I was met at the door by one of his security personnel who escorted me into the living room, which was beautifully furnished and decorated. Spence and an African-American man in his 40s were reclined on the living room's chocolate-colored sofa, and I was directed to a leather chair that was adjacent to the sofa. And after I sat down, he introduced me to Larry King, his African-American friend. Spence certainly didn't come across as the reprobate described by the escorts, but rather he appeared to be a refined gentleman. After Spence's perfunctory introduction, he launched into a long-winded soliloquy. His initial remarks were of a resume of sorts. He said that he was a lobbyist as well as a consultant for various interests in Japan and the healthcare industry. Spence then told me that he had, quote, friends who were perched at the pinnacle of power. He emphatically stated that he held the reins to omnipotence and he had the ability to make a life-altering phone call. He repeatedly reiterated that he could make, quote, life-altering phone calls. After Spence concluded expounding on his power and connections, he discussed my role in his grand vision. He made it crystal clear that my escorts were interacting with the most powerful men in the country, so the caliber of escort was imperative to him. He required the highest quality escorts who were punctual and impeccably dressed. He required escorts who were articulate and appeared to be college graduates. He required that I diligently screen and qualify escorts to meet his lofty standards. Spence barked out his demands as if he were barking out orders in Marine boot camp. Andy emphasized that it was a privilege for me to provide him with escorts. King also chimed in about his exalted status and clout too. I felt like Spence was putting on a show for King, but King wasn't an individual who acquiesced to being outboasted. They pumped themselves up. King then made a number of disclosures that I found to be absolutely bizarre. He revealed that he and Spence operated an interstate pedophile network that flew children from coast to coast. King also discussed that he and Spence had a clientele of powerful pedophiles who actually took pleasure in murdering children. In fact, King seemed to be obsessed with the subject of murdering children. I sincerely thought that I was talking to a pair of psychotics on the run from a psychiatric hospital. After Spence and King conversed about their rarefied statuses and their extreme pedophilic perversities, Spence shifted gears and started to sincerely inquire about my life. He asked where I was born and where I attended college. He then questioned me about the particular of my escort service. In the context of our earlier discussion, Spence's questions seemed like non sequiturs to me. Though I answered Spence's questions truthfully, I was uncertain about the motivation for his inquiries because Spence struck me as an individual who generally had a self-centered, utilitarian reason for every action. As Spence inquired about my life, King sipped on his drink and was ominously silent, but an unnerving smile was etched across his face. When Spence finished quizzing me about my life, he stood up and gestured for me to accompany him. I stood up and followed him. King remained seated on the sofa. Spence walked toward a, a large mirror that was situated on the living room wall and opened a closet door that was in the corner of his living room. He popped open a secret panel that was embedded in the closet and stepped into a small room that was behind the mirror. I cautiously paused at the threshold of the closet, but Spence waved his right hand, signifying that I should follow him into the surreptitious room. The mirror on the living room wall was, in fact, a two-way mirror, and the room had a video camera on a tripod that was pointed toward the living room and also a wall of video monitors. Spence leaned over one of the video monitors and, after tapping a few of its buttons, he replayed the concluding minutes of our conversation. At that moment, I felt shrink-wrapped by cellophane, and I found it difficult to breathe. 
As I silently stared at the monitor, Spence casually smiled and explained to me that his entire home was bugged for clandestine surveillance. End quote. CIA operatives had installed the concealed video cameras throughout his house. He couldn't help himself from crowing that his surveillance equipment was state-of-the-art and the camera that captured our conversations was embedded in the living room's thermostat. Spence then divulged that he blackmailed the rich and powerful. I remained stunned and speechless as I watched myself discussing my life and escort service on the video monitor, but after a few minutes I started to swell with anger. However, I didn't express my anger to Spence because at that moment I was undeniably frightened of him and I'm also not a confrontational person. Once Spence had flaunted his blackmail equipment, he dispensed a grave threat about the quote consequences if I uttered nary a word relating to his concealed cameras. He then dismissed me. As we sat in Spence's living room, Spence and King once more broached the subject of me procuring children for them, but they started becoming extremely aggressive. Although I emphatically told them that I wouldn't pander children, their demands escalated to an inexorable crescendo. Spence and King finally demanded that I pluck destitute children off the streets of D.C. and deliver the children to them. I was essentially blackmailed during my first meeting with Spence and King, and I found my subsequent meetings with the tandem quite unpleasant, because they attempted to coerce me into ensnaring children for them. King had previously mentioned that he flew children into D.C., and the escorts I employed confirmed that minors were in attendance at Spence's orgies. Despite my earlier state of denial, I had come to the horrifying conclusion that Spence and King operated an interstate pedophile network for their power broker cronies. But I absolutely refused to aid and abet their abuse of children, despite Spence's potential to blackmail me or perhaps even kill me. How old were these boys and girls? Um, they could be anywhere from probably 8, 10, 12 years old all the way to um, usually their early 20s. And where did they come from? Some of them came from Omaha, some of them came from New York, or you had them out in Washington, D.C. You know, a lot of them, they were street kids, yeah. and he had a way of finding people who would um, not be missed. He'd find somebody out on the street, and he'd bring them in, and get, feed them, clothe them, give them a real nice, glamorous life, yeah. and next thing you know, it's payback time. They would get these kids from the street. Mm -hmm. He'd offer them a life, and they didn't realize that he was going to take it. Well, how much was drugs involved in all this? Very much. From what standpoint? Drugs was a strong part of uh, how they got control of some of the kids, because that's what some of the kids were there to get. They would uh, do the sexual uh, acts and then be provided with uh, cocaine or uh, whatever type of drug they wanted. There was a, a party that I was at in Washington, D.C. on Embassy Row mm -hmm. where he had the table laid out like you would a fine buffet. Well, they had little salt dishes with razor blades and, and spoons and with, you know, a little straw on them. Yeah. And a bowl full of cocaine in a punch bowl. And again, these are people, politi politicians and people like that were attending these parties and partaking in this. Some of these things were cloaked in secrecy because a lot of them were instigated out of the back. That's the Air Force Base in Omaha. That's uh, Strategic Air Command. What did they have to do with it? That's where a lot of the MK Ultra things went on, the mind control. A lot of the kids were brought in, they were either drugged or they'd taken through this MK Ultra mm -hmm. and do the mind control. Larry was very good at that. And what about these snuff films? Did he do those indoors or outdoors? They were usually done in out of the way, you know, they were um, places that, like an old farmhouse or something like that, yeah. where they would sacrifice somebody. Well, who, would, who would they sacrifice? Basically, they could take one of the kids. So the kids that have been kidnapped or otherwise? I guess. You know, as far as I could tell, that's where, where they come from. He had a daycare center in Omaha that he ran as a non-profit. What was Larry doing at the daycare center? Oh, he was finding kids. Okay. And he would go rent them out, mm -hmm. um, whether it be for himself or for others. How did they get that past the parents, for example? You know, a lot of them were orphans, the three kids. He'd say, well, my son's having a party, a sleepover or something like that. And the way Larry put it was, this is so bizarre that nobody will ever believe you if you told them. Even to this day, people think that I'm full of it by yeah. relating to them some of the things that have went on. To the point to where I realized what was going on, I knew that if I was just to go to somebody and say that, you know, this is what's happening to 
they would basically squash me. King was arrested, and a federal investigation showed he'd stolen $14 million from Franklin. But the FBI's inquiries were secret, and evidence of King's sex ring was quickly covered up. They didn't ask me very much about Larry King. They treated the allegations that I made about people who abused me almost like a joke. A list of 271 victims of King's abuse was compiled, all recalling the same story, being taken to parties by King and abused by prominent figures. And the information presented to the Foster Care Review Board, either via the telephone reports, the personal reports, or the reports we reviewed, uh, Larry King's name was consistently present as someone that the youth were making allegations against. I mean, I turned that information over to authorities, and nothing happened. I would say we handed over at least a foot high um, amount of material. Generally speaking, uh, the allegations were ignored. The New York Times revealed that both federal and state investigators were given thousands of files from abused children and their testimonies. But instead of bringing those victims justice, Douglas County and federal grand juries ordered the files to be sealed, neglected to interview witnesses, and even filed charges of perjury. And what happened when all of this came to light? The FBI stepped in and cross-examined every one of the children and told them if they did not recant their testimony, they would be liable to as much as 530 years in prison for perjury. They were grilled for hour on hour. The ones who didn't recant ended up either dead or in jail. The media immediately started discrediting the witnesses. The paper never looked for information that would support any of the allegations. The whole purpose of the stories was to destroy any credibility that these youth may have. I was very disappointed with the way uh, the FBI and law enforcement treated the victims. They, in fact, uh, turned them into the offenders, so to speak. This is unprecedented, probably in the history of the United States, commented Dr. Judianne Denser Gerber, a lawyer, psychiatrist, and nationally prominent specialist on child abuse, during her visit to Nebraska in December 1990. If the children are not telling the truth, particularly if they have been abused, they need help, medical attention. You don't throw them in jail. It's not going to be believed, believed, they said. It will not be believed. You will be found guilty of perjury. I mean, they weren't telling me maybe. You know, they were saying, uh, it's, you're not, it, there's no way. You're going, you go on with the story, you're going to jail. I mean, that was said to me direct. And instead of taking the evidence that was delivered to them by the victims and interrogating the persons who the victims identified, uh, they seemed to bear down and try to get the victims to change their story. The FBI's attitude was, you know, just no, this, these kind of things don't happen. From the first interview when I went, you know, and realized they don't believe the fucking thing I'm saying, you know, I mean, they are, I mean, they, they were just appalled, but I realized what that, that look in their eye was back then, it was fear. It was fear of, every, you know, I mean, I had witnessed, you know, firsthand things that would, you know, destroy this city, you know, people at a position, you know what I mean? Pedophilia owns this nation. Pedophilia is part of what we're talking about. And the hiding of the pedophiles is being done by none other than the FBI. You literally have to have bricks for brains to take on the FBI in this country. And that's exactly what you have to do to do this properly. They now, in my opinion, in my investigation, are the architects of the cover-up. The FBI has been informed as to everything that has come out of Benassi's mouth. And that was done by his attorney, John DeCamp. I submitted it to them. And it was like a, a forbidden zone I'd entered where they won't even communicate on it or talk to you or even reply. Under pressure from the FBI, Troy Bonner agreed to tell a Douglas County grand jury investigating Larry King that he and Alicia Rowan had concocted the entire child abuse story on payment of a $500 bond. Troy Bonner was to be the star witness against Alicia Rowan, but he grew uneasy about maintaining what he claims were the lies fed to him by the FBI. But when his brother Sean died in an inexplicable gun accident, Troy and his family were convinced they'd been sent a warning message. And those of us that didn't like to be involved and didn't want to be involved were threatened. For some reason they had to send a signal to every kid who was a potential witness. A signal so loud and clear, if you dare to come forward, if you dare to talk, watch what happens. And they threatened, you know, that I can go find somebody that will kill you, and it will kill your family. Um, you don't tell anybody. Both grand juries admitted that Alicia Owen and Paul Bonacci, whose testimony extensively corroborated Owens, had been badly abused. But this was done, they concluded, by persons other than those the young people named. Bonacci, too, was indicted for perjury. Two other victim witnesses, whose stories buttress those of Owen and Bonacci, recanted under immense pressure. Alicia Owen and Paul Bonacci refused to recant. Every victim witness who stepped forward in any way, or even was a potential witness that somebody heard about, has either been killed, put in jail under some theory or other, terrified or run out of the state, 
discredit it. Is there a way for a, a well-prepared person to to come out uh, attaining justice if they've been falsely accused? Rarely. Is it just the it stack is just a so lot of money. It takes a lot of people behind you, and you know if you're just one person, you have to to rely on public defender. You might as well kiss it goodbye. Obviously, the FBI was protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of old pedophiles having improper relations with little boys. They were protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of drug peddlers. The FBI was brought in because I think one of the, uh, the few law enforcement entities that had enough power, enough resources, and the wherewithal to be able to do such a massive um, cover-up. If you told somebody, you may be telling the wrong person. Yeah. And it would leak out, leak up, whatever. And you may find yourself dead. You may find family members dead. They were protecting some very prominent politicians, some very powerful and wealthy individuals associated with those politicians and the political system, up to and including the highest political people in this entire country. The Omaha World Herald was run by Harold Anderson. Okay. He had a farm place outside of Omaha, and they would go out and have various things out at that farm. Mm -hmm. okay. You're talking about ritualistic kind of stuff? Yeah. Okay. And some of the kids were brought out there, the ones that were kidnapped. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that farmhouse played an important role. <laughs> this is an incredible story, Rusty. What? How much did Satanism play into the picture there? Was that a big part of it? What was it all about? 